Welcome back to Akansha. And Oscar, how good were the games on Sunday this week? Man, really great games. Or partidos, as you'd say in Spain. Yeah. Lots of entertainment, lots of excitement, lots of goals. And enjoyable Sunday. Yeah, especially the last two games. They have you on the edge of your seat almost, like with the Celta yeah. Mallorca one and the Best Atleti, which was like a very high quality game. But let's start at the top with Real Madrid versus Real Sociedad. And my word, this was Real Madrid's best performance this year, wasn't it? Yeah, by far this year, this was their most complete performance. They were very sharp, very fit. Like they looked in a totally different gala to, the, to their opponents. And even when the scoreline was like 2 1, you never saw a wave back for the opponents. That's how good Real Madrid were. They scored some amazing goals. Like, I wonder what's going on in the <laughs> They're always scoring great goals every week. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Like, when Kamavinga scores that, and you're like, okay, this, no one's going to beat that. And Modric, like, two minutes later, unleashes a rocket. And you're just like, wow. <laughs> All of them left footed as well. Yeah. And it's like the Modric one just like bends into the top corner. It's like one of those goals where that you can see coming. And with Modric, like he scores one of those goals like every season. And, every season. And this was the season. I think he scored a brilliant one against Shakhtar last year, which was like even better. Yeah, the one against Shakhtar it was really, really good. Yeah. And going back to Real Madrid, they changed the strategy a bit because in the last couple of weeks or since the start of the season, Real Madrid, they favored uh, pressing a bit of medium to low block. But in this game, they had a very high line. And in the last five minutes, they killed Real Sociedad. Real Sociedad couldn't get out of their own half. You had Militao, you had Alaba all pressing very high, all getting into the Real Sociedad box. And they found a way to get out of it. Yeah. Do you think this is the way to go when approaching that PSG game? This is the way they should go for that game. They shouldn't be afraid of PSG because... Let's face it, at this point, you have nothing to lose. Just go for them. PSG, while they are very good, they are vulnerable. So you should go for them with that high intensity press. And for that game, they're going to be without Mendy, Casemiro. And we the reports say that Chris might be out. Fede Valverde missed this game. Mm-hmm. How do you see Kamavinga... And let's say a Ceballos doing to replace those big names because those are huge absences. As you said, Ceballos, like my this team, I already gave Real Madrid a low chance of making it back due to the absences. But when I figured out who the replacements would be, I'm like, <laughs> it's still possible though. It's Real Madrid. It's, it's in the Champions League at home. Would it still go- obviously make it true? But I don't know. The lack of a fixed number six is what's really going to kill them. Yeah, because I can imagine Kamavinga can play that role, but he's not disciplined enough for yeah, he's, a game he's not like disciplined. that. This is actually one of the few games that he started this season and he wasn't taking off at halftime due to like indiscipline or getting yellow cards and stuff. So I don't know how they're going to replace both Casemiro and Chris in one night. Yeah. And from what Carlo Ancelotti said, it seems like he's optimistic that Cruz can make it. But yeah, without Cruz, uh, without Valverde, because if Valverde plays, he and Kamavinga can bring that energy, which Real Madrid sort of lacked. And it seems like with Cruz and some extent with Koke and, and Atletico Madrid, like once they've gone out of the teams, both teams, it seems like there's more energy in that midfield for both clubs. Yeah, true, because the players that have been brought in are the energetic kind. At the same time, more energy doesn't always mean better. So, yeah, that's true. I don't know. With athletics working because someone like Condogbia and Actorera are energetic but have lots of patience on the ball, like Pauza. Yeah. Kamavinga isn't really developing into that yet. So yeah. I don't know. It's going to be different. It's pretty raw. Like Kamavinga is still a teenager. He's playing. He's still a teenager. He gets it. Yeah. Yeah. And you on Saturday, you were very disappointed with Real Sociedad. So take them apart. Why were they so poor? 
first of all, if you're going to play out from the back, you have to do it well. You like they give turnovers at the edge of their box too many times. Real Madrid should have scored more than four. Like that's how dominant, that's how bad the defense was. Overall, the whole approach of having both Isaac, Oya Fabal, and Silva at the edge of your own box, and like I felt that was too negative. Yeah. And that's and Real Madrid grew into the game eventually. At first, they found it difficult, but you know, eventually they were able to break through. Also, the fact that Real Madrid are playing a high line, I feel part of the reason is because they had no one to mark. Like Alaba and Milita would intercept the ball and immediately run into the box because they had no one to worry about. Yeah, so, yeah that's true. The, the tactics were too negative from Real Sociedad. And, and the second you... half, yeah. even though they like changed formation, the approach was still bad. Yeah. You almost forget that Real Sociedad started winning this game. And again, it's like, I also question, like you question on Saturday, mm-hmm. the lineup. Why didn't Aritz or Zubi Mendy start? Mm-hmm. And it just, like, it felt like a very negative lineup from them, like you said, and very negative tactics. And this is a common thread because Ralph says that generally against the top teams, against the top seven, they haven't won. They've lost most of the games by heavy score lines. And again, we're here, sat here thinking, like, where do they go from here? We thought they improved with the game against Mallorca, but here we are again. Yeah. They need to look into this in, over the summer if they want to, like, evolve. But like I said, it's okay being the kind of team they are now, just getting Europa League. That's all fine and good. Some teams would kill to get to Europa. So. Yeah, that is true. And thinking about teams that didn't do well with a high press, Sevilla, like Real Madrid's lead at the top is now eight points because Sevilla, they had a terrible performance in Victoria against Alaves, tying 0-0. They, they really failed in this game, Sevilla. Like, they were, they were awful, weren't they? Yeah, they were bad. Again, their last two away games have been the same team. They particular Alaves and Espanyol got a point when they should have gotten three. Yeah. The like problem it, with Alaves is that all the chances created, none of them fell to possibly. Yeah. Yeah, because in the first half, like at the end of the first half, you got that feeling that Alaves deserved more. They were the ones creating the chances. They were the ones who were showing more desire for it. And Sevilla, like their team, I know they've had the injury problems. I know they're somewhat overperforming this season, but if you're in this position and you have this opportunity to challenge for the league, like you'd expect them to show more against an Alaves yeah, side <laughs> that um, struggled against 10 men in Tafe last, last week, but they didn't show any, they didn't show too much intent. They struggled to break through that high press. And it, it makes me worry what's going to happen to them against West Ham, who are a much better side than Alaves. We know English sides like to press high. And how are they going to figure that out if they're struggling against one of the worst teams in La Liga, or in fact, I think the little worst team in La Liga? Yeah, it depends. I don't know who, who is going to be able to make it back for that game against West Ham this Thursday. If some players come back, they'll obviously improve based off of that. Like if Fernando is there, I'm sure they won't have been as bad as they were on Friday. Or if Diego Carlos is back and it's, I mean, Goodell had a good game at center back, but yeah. it's not Diego Carlos. And obviously the team is going to be more guarded than it would normally be. So yeah. It depends on who makes it back. And they're really missing Papo as well. He's been by far the best player and he's been the more creative player. But again, Sevilla, it's been five draws in their last seven games. And that's not a form of a side. That's going to challenge. I think, do you think there's still a chance for them to maybe catch up to Real Madrid? Real Madrid still have some difficult games to play, like they had Barcelona in two weeks, Atletico, Sevilla themselves. So it it is possible. Yeah, but Sevilla also have difficult games too. That's true. They have Barcelona away. I mean, it's it's, it's possible, but even before Real Madrid won, Real Madrid can lose the next two. 
but Sevilla will draw again. Yeah, lucky yeah. for them. They're playing Ryan X. So we're, we're having an awful season, but we'll get to yeah, so our awful second they half. Can, yeah. 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 They can probably jump on this Ryo train of bad results <laughs> and bounce back from here. I have a question for you, though. If Sevilla, let's say, let's say Real Madrid win the title, and Real Madrid are a fantastic team, and they deserve it, in my opinion, if they do win it. But let's say they lose second place and they finish, let's say, fourth or third. Will this season be a success for Sevilla or will it be a failure? It depends on what they do in the Europa League. If they win the Europa League, they won't care if they finish third or fourth or even fifth. There'll be some concern, obviously, but I don't know. Let's say they don't win the Europa League and they don't finish second. That would be bad, in my opinion, because yeah. the gap you had on everyone else was so much. Yeah. And Lopetegui blames the injuries. Do you think that's a good enough reason? Because to be fair, they've had like six, eight absences in most games since mm -hmm. end of November. So they have but been the, struggling. The time. injury blame is fair. But also, you have to kind of look at the statistics and say sometimes he plays it too safe, sometimes he could make them press more, be on the front foot more, instead of just reacting to what the opposition does. True, sure, true. And there's that debate in Sevilla right now. Like, do they play like Betis? Like, we saw and Betis today, and they were on the front foot. Every time they recovered the ball, they were always trying to attack, always trying to score. But with Sevilla, it feels like they only, they keep the ball, but they keep the ball defensively. Yeah, they keep the ball defensively. That's yeah. the word for it. For it. Right now, Barcelona are just four points behind them. They possibly can catch them. It was a very warm day in Canada, so I took advantage of that day and I missed this game a bit. But the theme I got from people who watched it was controversy with the penalties. Yeah. Okay, first off, after seeing two penalties, because I missed our penalty that we scored from, I'll say that Barahan. It don't mean to handle that ball, so I won't have given that penalty for us. For that same reason, I won't have given the penalty against Jordi Alba. So both are non-penalties in my book. And it's a problem with, with the law in La Liga this season, or this season in general with the penalties, because even from the images, we saw there was a hand in the pie prior to the penalty. Yeah, it looked like a hand in the pie, yeah. but that guy didn't touch his hand. It was after... Like if the, if it touched the player's hand, it probably came after it touched by hands. And then yeah, and then we saw like the penalty this time with Sada Lee as well, which was <laughs> that, was that. The, and that was like possibly one of the clearest ones that I saw. He punched the ball away. <laughs> <laughs> but, but on Barca, like was this a difficult game for them? Was this a game where they just had to grind out the result? Because Elche they have been fantastic in twenty twenty two. Uh, despite the fact that there was controversy, I thought we played well today. The frustrating thing was that we should have scored like two goals before they scored off our mistake. Yeah. And, I, and this goes back to a problem we've had all season. We that was missed... a wicked assist by Pedri, though, for their goal. <laughs> yeah, that was a wicked <laughs> It was better than the one he gave. <laughs> no, it wasn't as good as the one he did to Nice one at the Euros. But <laughs> anyway, anyway, the thing is that. We give away, like we miss too many good chances. And then the first chance the opposition has is in the net. Yeah. It's rinse and repeat. It's the 15th time this season that we've yeah. considered from the first shot on target. So, but you can't really blame Ter Stegen today. Like, I, I, can't, I didn't, I, I've had my problem with Ter Stegen, but I didn't blame him for this one because yeah. De Jong should have scored, Dembele should have scored. But besides all that, we created enough chances to win. We won in a controversial way, yes, but if you look at it overall, uh, another day we probably win the game more comfortably. And Elche, as he said, they've been very good in 2022, especially at home, so it was never going to be easy. And Galatasaray, do you have any worries about them on Thursday? Um, I think... Surprisingly, they are mid-table in the Turkish league, so 
I, I don't really know why they're so bad this year, but I don't know. I, I just feel we should get the job done in Catalonia because the away atmospheres in, in Turkey are really intense and yeah. could overwhelm the players. So hopefully we can put in a good performance against them. Especially Europe. when you have Real Madrid after that game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But like, let's let's talk about Clasico. Let's talk about the the Clasico this week. Betis versus Atletico Madrid, and I see this game in three phases. The first phase was when Atletico had like the normal eleven that he that they played, and I felt they were really good. Mm-hmm. In the second phase, when Versaco got injured, Correa got injured, and Betis took control, and they created chances. They should have scored like two or three goals in that in that period. And in the second half, Atletico were. They were back. It was another. It was a solid performance by Atletico. It was a good away performance from them. Yeah, they weren't great, it, but they did. They, they got the job done. I described this second half as a counter-attacking masterclass because that's what it was. The first half, or most of it, like you said, Betis were in control and should have scored there. In the second half, besides the early tail chance, Betis didn't really threaten Opa too much. Atleti mm-hmm. were solid, they got blocks in, they countered viciously, like, man, it was, it was a really good counter-attacking performance from them. Lorente was excellent. Oh, yeah. It was great. Griezmann was influential when he came on, too. Carrasco yeah. was making some bad decisions. <laughs> yes, yeah, but he was a solid performance from them as well. Yeah, that's about Felix for a moment, because he's been on a tear recently like he's been getting assists scoring goals and he got a brace today he should have gotten a hat trick i feel the one that the referee disallowed from the goal should have stood and that would have been a crazy goal yeah, that and, crazy. and he he's been he's been atleti's best player he's showing why atleti brought him from benfica he's playing he's like finally getting into his own skin at, at the moment yeah, he's playing some magical stuff now, Felix. And this comes from constantly being the starting eleven for the last four games he's producing. Uh, we'll see if Dickie continues, but right now, the feeling I'm getting is that he's finally maturing into the forward that he was brought in to be. To be. And Atlantis' recent performance is like they've gone back to back to basics, back to the old Atletico from 2014 to 2016, and it's working for them. They defend very well. They counterattack, as you said, it was counterattacking masterclass. And now top four is in their hands. Yeah. And do you see them slipping up, like letting that top four slip up? Or is it from now on till the end of the season, they're just going to like keep on getting those results, maybe put pressure on Barca and Sevilla? Uh, it's... It, the future is very unpredictable, but I think the feeling now is that they'll hold on to the top four. You know, let's say they get knocked out against my United, which I hope they don't. They'll have top four to focus on. I think then they'll definitely get it. Yeah. But my feeling is that this whole thing is far from over. So oh, yeah. Yeah, because Betis are they're they're a brilliant team, and today yeah. they had they were missing a lot of players. They didn't start Gudo, they didn't start Juanmi. Canales was suspended for this game, but um, if I was to pick out a best player who really impressed me, it was Savali. Like he, yeah, Savali was great. Yeah, like his runs were great. He he really terrified Atleti's yeah. uh, left side, and he was like the only one there <laughs> against three or four players, and he was he was really good. Yeah. Also, his defensive recoveries. I remember a moment in the first half where they had a three on one. Oh, yeah. That one was the goalkeeper. Yeah. And he came. And that, was, that, was a, that was immense for me. Yeah, he's much better than Barry Rene. Yeah, that was my feeling. I felt like overall in the summer, like he, they bought a really good player. It's just that he got injured early. And yeah. They had to get better in. But I'm sure if they haven't fit for the Copa del Rey final, which Betts has got to... It, I think it, he should start. He yes. should start. Yeah, and how, how important is winning a cup like this for Betis? Like winning the Copa del Rey? Like let's say they don't make it to top four and they win a Copa del Rey. Do you think that's a good trade-off for them? That's a very good trade-off because 
we have to remember this is their second, their first final since 2005. So yeah. that in its, you know, of itself is a very good achievement for the green and white half of the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. winning the cup, especially since it's going to be your captain's probably last trophy, would be an emotional and amazing football story. Story, yeah. And do you see any problems for them when they play Eintracht Frankfurt? Um, I think Frankfurt are aren't tenth in the Bundesliga. They won this weekend, but I think Betis should have too much for them. Yeah. For Betis yeah. yeah. So we'll be, keep our eye out, eyes out for that. And the good thing for Betis is that Real Sociedad, Villarreal also lost, and Villarreal they lost in. In Pamplona, Chimiavila being the hero again. He's not. He's no longer the pantomime villain, and he's no longer <laughs> hacking people down. He's scoring goals. And Villarreal's momentum dropped. Where did they lost lose this game? I think they lost this game in the same way they didn't beat Juventus. The lack of a fixed number nine, because for some reason, Emery doesn't trust Bulaide enough to start him. I think Villarreal suffered from not having someone in the box to just be there and get on the end of these close chances and occupy center backs because Dan Juma, Lo Celso, um, even Jared, Jared isn't going to do that. So they need that fixed number nine in there to score the chances they get. Yeah. And Firstly, they couldn't do that this weekend. This weekend. And it's sort of strange because like when Dia gets his chances, he's proven to be a very efficient forward. He's proven to be a yeah. very good forward. Initially he struggled. But before he went to the African Cup of Nations, he was scoring goals for fun, and he seemed to be integrated. So it's it's a really strange decision for memory, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, but the team carrying the flag for the Valencian community was Valencia, and they they were brilliant in the second half. Gonzalo Guedes scoring, Maxi scoring for the first time in a thousand years. <laughs> We've been waiting for that for a long time. <laughs> And all in all, it was a it was a very comfortable win for Valencia and in a what has been a great week for them, reaching the Copa del final. Did you see Guedes' goal against Athletic? Yeah, so I, I, I watched the game in the second half when I found out there were two goals because I saw Valencia starting lineup and I was like, I'm not watching this. <laughs> but it, it felt to it felt it was going to be painful, but then I heard Soler was bowling and I was like, I have to see this. Yeah, it was a very good performance from Valens, barring Dwame and their most <laughs> comical bit. Yeah, they totally dominated Granada. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah, it was also great that Maxi got on the scholarship as well. And what has been a great week for Valencia too. Yeah, the Copa del Rey, like it's it's been amazing for the club because like this is a club that has been it's and medium like turmoil it's like always a crisis every other week yeah. the owners fight over the fans and yeah like Valencia gets into the Copa del Rey final is huge for the club it's huge for the city and even with Betis like seeing the way the both fans the way they reacted to get into the cup final it's like it was something nice to see because like they really want it and it's good because like in the past the Copa del Rey has been looked down upon as like a trophy that you win just to save a season or it's just to collect but you can see really both fan like with real madrid with barcelona when they won it okay, okay, okay. it's seen as like it's seen as like with those fan bases it's seen as like okay it's like yeah we won couple of array but like with valencia with betis with real sociedad last season we're seeing especially with the change of the tournament we're seeing like a lot of fan bases really take it seriously and like yeah. really want to win it Sure, because this format, like, there's literally no room for error. As they yeah. say in Spain, every game is a final. <laughs> yeah, now they're going to yeah. play a proper final. <laughs> yeah. And I think now Valencia and Real Betis can say we're playing the final. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but this Valencia Granada game, it wasn't without um, bad news. Robert Moreno, he's been sacked in Granada. How will you sum up his time in Spain? In general in Granada, do you think it was a harsh decision? It's a fair decision given that the team wasn't showing any signs of turning this run around and they're so close to the relegation zone. But the thing is that his time wasn't really bad because I saw 
some of the things you're striving to implement, try to make your hand more football-y, while at the same time trying to maintain solidity, but different things like injuries and the fact that some important players from last season aren't there anymore kind of yeah. affected them. And he took some big scalps this season. They beat Sevilla, they beat Atletico. They went undefeated in both games against Barca. I felt they were very unlucky against um against Villarreal two yeah. weeks ago. And so like, but I can understand when you're you get that run of results and you're that close to the relegation zone with eleven games to go, you will it's it's understandable that the sacking will come, but I, I do think it's harsh because a team like Granada or like Osuna or Rayo at the moment, there comes a time in the season where they go like six to eight to ten games without winning. Without a win. It's the natural curse of things. And most also times think, they come at, yeah. I also think another thing that influenced the decision was the fact that the other, the tree behind them have somewhat improved over the last three weeks. Yeah. So I think that's why they kind of said, let's just try and get these 11 games under control. Yeah. And yeah, it's, but this weekend, it's not too gloomy for Granada because Celta versus Mallorca, oh my God, what a game that was. <laughs> yeah. That game. And did you hear um, Eduardo Chacho Caudet's quotes before the game? No, I didn't. No, so. What did he say? It's funny how football works in life works. He was like, before the game, they asked him, would they prefer to win 1-0, 4-3? And it was like, I prefer to win 4-3 <laughs> rather than I love that guy. Because <laughs> yeah, last season, Celta had a lot of 4-3 results in them, 4 yeah. against them. This season, they've been more defensively solid. But today, any defensive solidity they thought they had out of yeah. the window. <laughs> Because if I do, the man I've been praising for weeks dropped his stinker. <laughs> yeah, he got an own goal. And all. It's own goal, like, error leading to goal. Yeah, and this was the perfect football game. You have the goals, you have the red cards, you have the penalties, you have the late, the late, late drama. winner. Yeah, late drama. The and... fact that Celta went ahead three times, America came back three times was so great, man. Yeah. And let, let's talk about Barry Aspas for a moment. Like, yeah. he scores the winner. He's the local hero. Like, he's the most underrated player in La Liga, like, in general, in the last, let's say, in the last decade. He's one of them, yeah. I, I don't think he's underrated by people who watch La Liga normally, but on the European stage, he's very underrated because he's had a few 20 goal seasons in him. Right now, he's the second highest scorer in the league behind Benzema. Yeah. And also, I saw the stats. In this century, in the last six seasons, he has the third most goals in the league. That, yeah. Obviously, Messi's first, Suarez is <laughs> second. Aspas is third. He's like one behind, he's one ahead of Benzema now. Damn, that's a power yeah. stat. Yeah. And he's like one of those players like who, if he found it, like I, I can see him fit in and maybe maybe he filled a Sevilla, but I can see him fitting into the current Sevilla and doing very well or fitting into Atletico Madrid and playing that like 10 role and doing brilliantly as well. Mm-hmm. And he's like those type of players like Matt Letizia who could have who in Southampton could have done better, but he never won trophies. And I think that that'll be the one regret in his career that he hasn't won trophy like as many trophies. He's won the Europa League, but he hasn't won as many trophies as he should have. Yeah, true, yeah. but at the same time, he has it like he's a legend at Celta, like he's kind of like Gail Maradona. So, yeah, I feel like having that sort of reverence, like you can just be retired and walk on the streets of Vigo and be like, Hey, look, mommy, it's Aspas. Like, yeah. That kind of thing, I feel it's better than having a trophy, to be honest. Because that, that is true, like, he would never have to buy drinks in Vigo for the rest of his life, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Mallorca, they've started scoring a bit, but they've forgotten how to defend. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how they transition from being a defensive team to a team that scores a lot, like their 3 2 win against Athletic Club the other week. Um, yeah. One of the key players from Mallorca recently, besides them, um, 
new signing Mariki has been Takekubo. He's been oh yeah, he's seen very good performances. Kangin has been playing well when he comes off the bench. I still don't guess why he doesn't start, but that's a story for another day. Yeah. Daniel Rodriguez, you know, he's always 100%. Yeah. I'm one of Kubo's biggest critics, as you know, but like. Oh, I'm his biggest hitter. <laughs> but this season, like. But I'm praising him. Good. So that's. He's been really good. Yeah. It's been good this season. And they've sort of been dragged into that relegation picture. They seem to be running away from it. And another team that's been dragged in is Hetafe. Espanyol, they got their first win of the new year. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and uh, Hetafe, they just couldn't find a way past them. Yeah. Hetafe, Espanyol basically scored, had two shots on target and scored this one. The other one was an own goal. Hetafe didn't have their shooting boots on, but they also didn't have some important players this weekend. Aaron Barry was a big miss for them. And at the back, Cuenca was unavailable. He's had a good year. Yeah. And uh, I still think Mallorca and, Gr- and Hetafe are safe. You still think the, three, so? the four below them are too... W- won't, I don't see them finishing under any of the four below them. I, I agree with Alavez, though, but with Cavith, like they just had the... I believe it was... I'm not sure if the status... First right, home win. First home win, yeah. And when I when I saw when I heard that I was like, that's so crazy to wait all the way up to March for it. Yeah. Idrisi had a good game, like the Sevilla Loni assist. Yeah. He took his goal very well. You don't think they can still put off a fight? And like in terms of no, points, it's not that. That is, I believe, can put up a fight. Alves, are gone for me. Levante are trying, but the gap is too. Much. Then Granada in free fall, so yeah, I don't even know. True. Let, let's look at it this way. Like, if Levante beats Athletic Club, who are, they're licking their wounds from what happened in the Copa del Rey. Yeah. So there might be six points separating those six teams. And the see. relegation picture looks totally different. Yeah, it'll be six points separating them, and then, yeah, true. But and then you also have to consider... Some like the six pointers, Cadiz have basically Cadiz will finish above Levante most likely because they have a good head to head. Yeah, and, that. and we all know with Levante, right? It's like whenever they're playing against like those top teams, they usually come alive and they have like Barca, they have Sevilla come in, <laughs> they have like Villarreal, a couple of Valenciano derbies, and I, I wouldn't count them out if they win against Athletic. That's all I'm saying. Sure, sure. Yeah. And uh, I, I still feel like overall the kind of positive year Hetafe has had. I'll be shocked if they go back down into the relegation zone. So yeah. Yeah. And before we before we leave La Liga, let's talk about Rio because they did okay in the Copa del Rey semifinals. They were, it was a very heartbreaking to concede that late. Uh, but in La Liga, they're they're stinking up the place at the moment. Yeah, today, I, I don't really know what to say about them. They've just been bad. Is, is I, I, a... guess it's, I guess it's because they were so good at the start of the season. It's naturally going to balance itself out. Yeah. But they need to, I think they'll still stay up. They aren't going to get relegated. But over the summer, they need to add serious quality. A goalkeeper is a must because yeah. Lucas Dan is not... <laughs> They're probably, need, they're probably in the striker. Yeah, yeah, they need a striker because Sia is not very good. Yeah, it's not, Guardiola is not reliable. Inteka. The goals yeah. dried up. Of dried up. Yeah. Inteka is good. They should keep Inteka. Yeah. Right? Inteka is good, but Inteka is not a striker. He's like more of a... Yeah, he's actually an attacking midfielder. So. Fielder, yeah. But I, I would worry for them a bit because if Kavith gets another win and let's say, hypothetically, they lose against Sevilla, they... <laughs> There's, they're in a relegation battle, pretty much. Let me see. No, I, I think the only teams in a relegation battle are those who have less than 29 points. Point. Okay. So, yeah, so if, if Ryo... If you have 30 down, at this point, you're yeah. safe because there's no way they won't get at least two more wins. Two more wins, yeah. Them. That is true. That's true. But if Ryo goes down, you're the one who kicks them, not me. 
<laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. So that's... Let, let's go to England and the Manchester Derby. I saw what you posted in your Instagram story about how one-sided it was. <laughs> and I just couldn't believe it. Like, how, like, describe the game. Like, why were City so dominant? Okay, here's the thing. Growing up, as someone who liked my neck, I saw a lot of Manchester therapies where City had a bad team, but they always came and gave it their all. Right? Because this is a derby, it means more than any other game. Yeah, yeah. So you have my United players not lifting a finger. How can you have 8% possession in 15 minutes? I'm still confused. <laughs> How is zero shots of any kind in the whole second half? Honestly, City should have won by more than. Okay, the first game City had against them was 2-0. That game should have been 6 or 7-0 based off the performance City had. Today, the same team, it was like, if I'm my United fan, I feel cheated by my players. Mm. That's, 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 those are big words. And Cristiano Ronaldo didn't partake in this game. Yeah. Is this... I, I've seen a lot of things where people say, oh, this is now sensational Twitter. Is that I could blame one player. Mm-hmm. Listen, which Ronaldo did have lost for one. Without him, they still lost for one. <laughs> it's not the problem. No. End of story. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's a big move by Ragnik, which I feel that those kind of moves, it tends to turn the dressing room against you. Yeah. Especially when it's such a big name and you bench that big name or you don't even call him up. But here's the story, though. I heard that. I've heard two stories. One, Ronaldo was injured. Yeah. Two, that Ronaldo was said he's going to be benched. He won't start the game. And then Ronaldo said, if you're not starting me, don't pick me for the ex- like the match day squad at all, which yeah. is a bigger problem for that- the whole team. Yeah, it, let's say it's option one. Yeah. That's fine. If it's option two, we've also seen instances where players have called Ragnik out on social media for lying. Like yeah. when Marcel and Lingard wanted moves away and, and Ragnik said, oh, they didn't want to play. And then they both came out on Twitter and said, hey, this is not true. We always want to play for my United. It just feels like it's a, it's the, like my United have failed to fix the problems they've had for many years and they just keep getting worse and worse and worse. But yet sometimes they pretend like, oh, there's no problem. We finished second. It's all sunshine and roses because yeah. we finished 19 points behind Man City. <laughs> I'm sorry I ranted a bit because no, no, this, this is one of the teams from my childhood. It's sad seeing them like this. I, I love a good rant, and it seems like they might not get into the top four because Arsenal are in such a good form right now. And they got that win against Watford. And what has changed for this team? Because when they started the season, they had those three back-to-back losses. But now it feels like like Juve, like Barcelona, all three teams, are they're back to where they believe they should be. Yeah. Um. I'm going to mention two players for us now, because Saka and Odita, they're, they've been really good this season. Despite the, the, the fact that those two, and Emil smith and Pepe sometimes, and Martinelli have chipped in with goals, means that they haven't really missed a number nine figure. Yeah. So, yeah. Overall, some people still have criticisms of Arteta, whether it's like his football is too robotic or he falls off to too many players, but there's no denying that they have the results now to back up the fact that they've improved. Yeah. The robotic football stance sounds like a mini Pep Guardiola. Yeah. It's like yeah. Pep Guardiola, but it's, it's more robotic than Pep's football. But to be honest, it is impressive. Like, it is impressive. It's impressive. With, especially, like, what he and Xavi are doing because they both they have, like, kids, right? Mm-hmm. Both of them. And I'm happy that Odegaard is doing so well because when... When he was going to Arsenal, a lot of Arsenal fans DM me and they asked me about him. I was like, this guy's going to be great for you. He's going to be like Ozil for you, even better. And I'm happy is he's sure in his worth. And it'll be interesting to see them back in the Champions League, losing five points to Bayern Munich again. <laughs> Who knows? 
Yeah, let Bayern have Arsenal back and leave us alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Arsenal have three games less than my United and ahead of them with one point. It's hard to see Arsenal losing any of those three games in hand. But even if they do, my United are yet to play Liverpool, yet to play Chelsea again, yet to play Arsenal again. So I think Arsenal have are going to be fought by a comfortable margin come the end of the season. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And speaking of Arsenal players, Olivier Giroud for Milan against Napoli, winning the big game in Italy. Wow. And Milan right now, they're top of Serie A. Inter are back to winning ways. Out of the Milanese clubs, who do you see winning the Scudetto? Juventus. <laughs> Juventus. Oh, wow. Yeah, because they are seven, they're seven points I'm, off. I'm joking, but... I just wanted to <laughs> make the trick because UV are getting close. Yeah, they but are. Out of the two of them, I see Milan winning because they... Milan. I don't know, Inter, sometimes when I try and keep up with them, it kind of disappoints me. Today, they and Lot like this weekend, they and Lot of Martinez got back in form against Sarantina, who haven't been really good for a while. And... It's funny because Lautaro Martinez hadn't scored since the previous meeting against Valentina. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. Mispronouncing yeah. the name. It's too so, long. So Lautaro is Valentina, man. That's what you're saying. Yeah. The same way <laughs> Messi is Eba, man. Eba, man. Felix is Asuna, Asuna, man. <laughs> yeah, but... These are all jokes, by the way. I don't <laughs> believe <laughs> Yeah, my, my bet is on Juve, to be honest. Like, I am crazy, but I think Juve... I'm not, I, I see where you're coming from because defensively, their numbers haven't been bad this season. It's just they haven't scored enough sometimes, but they both love it, and he's remedied that a bit. Sure, and, and they're in a more comfortable position now regarding the top four. Like I said, yeah. Arsenal, Barcelona, Juventus, they're teams that we didn't expect to be in the top four, but they find themselves in a comfortable position, especially given that Roma Atalanta finished 1-0. The, the biggest surprise for me was that the game actually finished one zero. It's like Roma Atalanta I expected like a four three four two, but All right. and that and that that keeps Juve like super comfortable. Things are changing for them. If regardless, like they could they could still qualify and get to the quarterfinals, and who knows? They play the winner of Atleti United or the winner of Benfica Ajax, and they're in the semifinals, <laughs> which would be a crazy story given how they've been this they season. The season. Yeah. But yeah. then they yeah. topped their group and they had Chelsea. So True. if they are a dark horse in every sense of the word. Yeah. And it will be surprising for them to reach another final and yet again lose another final because it's final. the Juventus way. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the history it's, of Juve. Like Yalini would say, the history of Tottenham. <laughs> Juve also have their own history. True. Yeah. Uh, Bayern, they drop points against Leverkusen. Did you see that coming? Yeah, because Leverkusen are a really good team. Sure. And yeah, Bayern, I, I was, it, was a, it was a weird game for Bayern because they couldn't really um, impose themselves on Leverkusen like they did with other teams. Yeah. And usually I expect the only other team to really give Bayern a game to be Gladbach because Gladbach have Bayern's number for some reason. <laughs> yeah. But this was an impressive game for Leverkusen mm -hmm. as they tried to finish second. Sure. They'll definitely be in the UCL next year. Second, oh, I believe so. Nice. Yeah. I think besides Barcelona, they're the best team in the Europa League, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah us and them. And, Severe. Yeah. So I, I have like high hopes for them because like when, when I saw them play against Betis, they were hugely impressive in both games. And they have like super really good players like Verts, like Diaby, they Schick. yeah, yeah, yeah. They have they have so many good players and mm -hmm. they play in such a nice style yeah. that you know what? Like when I saw this game, I wasn't surprised that like they gave Bayern a good game. Mm -hmm. They were able to take a point from them. But what that does is it opens the door against Borussia Dortmund. 
they play against Mainz later on, are they going to miss this opportunity again? Are you going to miss this train to make the Bundesliga closer? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's. I, I would have thought so too. <laughs> because it, the, the thing with Dortmund is that you have all these off the pitch. The, the Holland team for me is a big distraction off the pitch. Yeah. What about Holland? Like he's missed so many games. Yeah. I don't want to say he's injury prone because. I don't know what the defi- exact definition of injury prone is because he's had different sorts of injuries that have kept him out for long stretches recently. Yeah. I don't know, that's, his, in- his fitness is something to watch for mm. whoever wants to buy him as well. Uh, yeah. The rumor is that Barcelona might be close, but that's for another period. That's what I'm <laughs> and moving finally in France, Nice, they closed the gap on the top of Ligue 1 to 13 points, <laughs> beating Paris Saint-Germain. <laughs> and I'm sure PSG, like their main focus was Champions League, the rest of the players. Yeah. Do you see this being a sign of things to come? Because they have been like suspects away from home. Nantes beat them 3-1 a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and the PSG are a weird team. Like sometimes they have a game like they did against Madrid where they're really, really good. And then if you're a good amount of their games, this is a struggle to win them like last minute or something. So I don't know. Real Madrid, they're there for the taking against Real Madrid. Okay. It's just that Real Madrid are missing three important players. So I think PSG will survive to the quarterfinals. Finals. Yeah. yeah. And it's well done to Nice, though. Yeah, they, they also in the French Cup final against Nantes. Yeah, and they've kept three clean sheets against PSG this season. They were the ones who knocked PSG out of the Cup um, the Cup de France as well. Yeah, did you see the pictures with Nantes at the yeah, end? Yeah, I saw. Uh, I thought the celebrations in Valencia and Betis were wild, but with Nantes, it was something else. Yeah, I, I'm, honestly, I just love like that. Like it feels like around Europe, the cups are beginning to gain more. Feel value. magical. Yeah, I don't know whether it's because like the leagues are being won by less and less teams, mm-hmm. but now it feels like the cups are very magical. I'm sure in Germany we'll see similar scenes with whoever is in the final. I think Coppa Italia is the one where it's like it's suited for the big clubs. Like they do love like the big clubs clashing in the finals yeah. and stuff. Uh, but let's talk on Nice again, just for a moment. Like Christophe Gautier, how good of a job has has he done in French football in general? Like with Lille, he won the championship with them. With Nice, he might take them to the Champions League. Yeah, he's doing, Christophe Gautier is doing a great job right now for Nice. Defensively, they're really, really good in attack. Um, players like Andy Derlot have really impressed this season. I, I think, yeah, they'll get top four. Uh, they'll get like the Champions League places, but hopefully uh, they can keep some of these players so we can see how far he can take them next year. Maybe possibly challenge for Ligue 1 again. Yeah, it's a different the, team. Yeah, the good thing about Nice is that they have a better financial backing than so it's yeah. it's potentially we could see this team in the long run be a fixture in the Champions League and with that I'm gonna end it it was nice to have you on <laughs> part nice. of the part <laughs> uh, and hopefully we can discuss next week with the Champions League action and thanks for coming and no problem thanks for having me as usual adios and vamos <laughs>